forms interacting with unit step functions and Dirac distributions in just a second. But first, let's figure out the Laplace transforms of the Dirac function and the unit step function, and also what the unit step function looks like when it's involved with other functions. So first, we'll take the Laplace transform of delta subscript t naught. Right? That means I'm going to perform an integral from zero to infinity of this delta subscript t naught of t e to the negative st dt. So how should I be thinking about this? Well, I'm thinking that this function is zero whenever t is not t naught. Right? So this Dirac function is zero whenever t is not t naught. And so what that will do is that will suppress any area under the curve coming from the exponential multiplier. More importantly, we can evoke the sifting function, which says I'm still going to integrate from zero to infinity. I will have this delta of t naught or subscript t naught of t. And then of all the heights that are expressed by e to the negative st, I only need the height associated with t being equal to t naught, and then I continue to integrate over t. Well, now this e to the negative st naught, now is, this is a no longer a function of time. And since it's no longer a function of time, I can bring that term to the outside of the integral. So I have e to the negative st naught up front, integral from 0 to infinity, and then delta t naught of t dt. But this integral has been defined to be equal to 1. Right? So the whole integral yields 1 leaving behind just the e to the negative st naught. Right, so that is the Laplace transform of the delta function. Again, I use the word function, but here I mean distribution. And so that gives me um, the delta. Now that I know that delta is connected to steps, right, because it represents a sudden change in the behavior of the system in the time domain, what I now get from this as well is that the appearance of exponential functions in the s domain is connected to quick changes in the t domain, in the time domain. So this is the first time in any of these videos that we've seen e to the negative s appear in the Laplace side, and what that means is that there's some sort of abrupt change, and that change is going to be related to step functions. So part two, why don't we take a look at the unit step? Taking a look at the unit step, I will take the Laplace transform of the unit step, u subscript c of t. And then when I take the Laplace transform of that, I have an integral from 0 to infinity of u subscript c of t, e to the negative st dt. What I need to recognize right here is that this function u is equal to zero for all t that are less than c. So what that means to me is that I am not going to integrate from zero to infinity. I'm going to only integrate from time c all the way to infinity. But during that time, from c to infinity, what is the step function? Well, the step function has just switched on to become the number one. And so really, I just integrate from c to infinity, e to the negative st dt. Performing that integral, I get e to the negative st over negative s evaluated from t equals c to t equal infinity. At the upper bound, I need this to decay. And so if I choose s to be greater than zero, well, when t goes to infinity, I'll have an e to the negative number, where that number is getting larger and larger and larger, and so I will get zero at the upper bound over this negative s, which doesn't matter, but then I will get minus e to the negative s times c all over negative s. And so I have e to the negative s times c all over s once I cancel those negatives out, so long as s is greater than zero. So the Laplace transform here tells me that the Laplace transform of the step function gives me an exponential factor, which is connected to abrupt changes in the time domain, as we've seen, divided by s. Okay. For the last trick, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the Laplace transform of the step function u sub c of t times f of t minus c, so some arbitrary function that has been shifted c units in time. And so when I take this Laplace transform, I get an integral from 0 to infinity of u subscript c of t times f of t minus c e to the negative st dt. And so now a couple things are going to happen. One, we're going to need to remember that this is equal to zero for all t less than c. So I'm going to strike out that lower bound and start it at c and get the exact same effect. And then the next thing that we want to notice is that um, I don't like this t minus c in the argument of f. I think it's muddling stuff up. So I'm going to introduce a new variable u. Uh, u is probably not a good variable. Let's introduce a variable v. And v is going to be equal to t minus c. c is a constant, so dv is just equal to dt. And so this dt is going to go to dv. This t right here is then going to go to v plus c. And then this t minus c right here is going to go to u, or sorry, v. And so let's write down the integral after all these substitutions. I'm going to hold off on the bounds really quick, so I'm going to integrate. I'm only going to integrate over the times for which that step function was on, and when it was on, it just became the number one for all t greater than or equal to c, which is the domain I'm integrating over. And so that will be one, and I will pick up an f of v e to the negative v minus c dv. So now I have an integral on v, but at the upper bound, well, if t is equal to infinity, right, then v will be equal to infinity because subtracting off a little bit of c won't really change it. And then at the lower bound, when t is equal to c, well, c minus c will give a lower bound of zero for the v variable. And so this is equal to, the last piece that we need to notice here is that this is e to the negative v. Oh, all this is, excuse me, this upper bound is really e to the negative vs minus um, cs. And so this at the upper bound, we have e to the negative vs times e to the negative cs. And so that e to the negative cs comes out front. It is not involved with the v integral. And then I have an integral from 0 to infinity of f of v, e to the negative vs dv. And what we want to know, notice about this integral is that this integral itself is the Laplace transform of f. So what we have now is that this is equal to e to the negative cs times the Laplace transform of little f, or e to the negative cs times capital F of s. And so if I take this result and put it back into this table element up here, I have that the Laplace transform of a step function times a function is e to the negative cs, indicating the time delay, the weight that's occurring in the, in the time domain, times capital F of s, which means that if I have a bunch of stuff capital F of S, which is multiplying this E 
then I will take that stuff and map backwards to the time domain to get my little f function. And then that e that's in the Laplace domain is telling me about, hey, you should wait. There should be a time delay associated with this. So wait c seconds and then turn this f function on. But the f function isn't really going to know about all this waiting. And so what it's saying is I'm going to be time shifted c units so that when I turn on, it's as if I didn't really understand the change in time. I just was, I was doing my thing. I just waited c seconds to do it. And then I picked up as if that were time zero. So this represents the Laplace transform of a function multiplying a step function, and we see that that is related to a function in the S domain multiplied by an exponential. So with these three transforms, we should be able to figure out what is going on with a very illustrative mass ring problem. We're now ready to talk about the effect of step function and Dirac external forcing with the simple harmonic oscillator. This is the nicest way to, to think about these functions, and so what we're going to have here is the left-hand side of our ODE, which is um, an undamped mass spring system, which means that we are going to give rise to homogeneous sinusoid dynamics. Okay. We're also going to have that the initial conditions involve no initial displacement and no initial velocity. So any dynamics are going to be a result of the external force. Well, what are, what is the external force in this case? What are we doing here? Well, we have this function right here, which is a Dirac or Dirac external force. And so it's going to be a pulse at time t equal a. And then what is the second piece of external force? Well, at time b, a constant force is applied. What that means to us is that um, the system will not be moving up until time A, where you will hit it with a hammer. Boom, then movement will start. What sort of movement? Movement, well, you'll see sine cosine dynamics as a consequence. And then at time B, and A is less than B, so A precedes B. So I hit it with a hammer. And then at time B, I'm going to, a good way to think about this, although it's not technically correct because the inertial force changes a bit, but you can think about the mass spring system taking on an extra load. So maybe you put like a mass on it at time B, and that mass is responsible for the new force. And that's not entirely right because that mass will change the overall mass of the system. So another way to think about it is that you're always just pulling down with a little bit more force. So what should happen then is that since you're pulling down with a little bit more force, you'll still see the sine cosine dynamics that are described, but this will just, or the step function turning on this extra external force will cause a change in displacement um, of the oscillation. So we'll continue oscillating just around a new equilibrium um, point. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to do this with Laplace transform. So I'm going to take the Laplace transform of both sides of the equation. And if I do that, I will solve for capital Y of S. And capital Y of S will be comprised of two terms. The first term is due to the Dirac external force. That's my F1 external force. And that I'm going to call capital Y1 of S. And that will be the response of the system to the pulse now in the Laplace domain, right? I'd like to figure out what that looks like in the time domain. And then there is the second term, Y2 of S, and that will be the response of the system due to the step function external force. And so what you want to notice about both of these is that there is this exponential factor that both pick up. That exponential factor is telling me, hey, something's going to happen. I'm reporting that something to you in the Laplace side. Exponentials are appearing. So whatever is happening in the time domain is happening with a time delay. And then what we'll notice is that they're basically the same transform, except there is this S multiplier in the denominator for um, for the step function form. So option one is to approach the problem with a convolution integral, and that is what I lay out here. And so you're going to want to take the inverse transform of both of these, and outlined here is how one does it. But maybe what we should look at instead are the partial fraction decomposition and the shifts that are necessary. So let's take a look at capital Y, one of S. So that is going to be the response of the system due to the pulse in the Laplace side. So we're going to need to map that back. So first thing I'm going to do, and the, the, just the statement associated with how to work with these exponentials is to take the exponential prefactor and move it all the way out front. I'm going to treat that as its last little bit so that everything else that is not that exponential is grouped together into its own term, and that term is going to be called capital F of S. Now, from capital F of S, I can recover a little f of t. So capital F of S transforms back to little f of t, and this capital F of S transforms back to a sine of omega t. So what that's saying is that the, res the, the response in the time domain of, of the system to the pulse of energy is going to be sinusoidal in nature, which is not unexpected. But the thing that is happening is because of this exponential factor, there is a delay of the response in the time domain to wait for a seconds, right? Because that hammer hit's not going to happen until a seconds. Well, how am I going to, going to deal with this? Well, I need to look at the inverse Laplace transform of a step function times a function, which is outlined here. And so what are the key pieces? Well, one... I'm going to factor that exponential out to the front. So I need to spot this. I need to notice it. I need to keep it out to the front. Right? And then two, after I do that, I figure out what capital F is. And then from capital F, I return to little f of t. And then now as I go all the way back to the time domain, what's going to happen is that there will be a step function that is introduced. And that step function is saying, hey, whatever's going to happen, you need to wait a seconds. And then a response will happen. And that response will be shifted a seconds in time. So this is f of t, which is our sinusoidal response, only it's been delayed in time a seconds because it is the response that is waiting for the hammer hit. And so now if I figure out little y1, I'm going to take the inverse transform of capital Y1, taking the inverse transform of capital Y1, all these constants get factored out to the front. And now I'm taking the inverse transform of this exponential times all this other razzmatazz. Well, the exponential gets factored out front. And then from all this razzmatazz, I figure out f of t is equal to the sine of omega t. And so upon transforming back, right, I get that there's a time delay given by the step function. And then I get that the sinusoid is going to kick on when that step function decides to kick on. It's just shifted to wait for that moment in time where the hammer hit happens. Okay. So that's how I get the, the response of the system to the Dirac pulse. What I need now is the second term, which is the response of the system due to the step function. We play the same game. We bring the exponential out front. We identify all the rest of the stuff, which is capital F. But now capital F, which is almost the same as it was before, I have this little s in the denominator as well. And so what that's going to mean is that capital F needs to be broken down with a partial fraction decomposition to strip off that one over s term and leave behind this s squared plus omega squared in the denominator term, which is speaking about my sinusoids. Applying partial fraction decomposition and finding my a's, b's, and c's by equating like coefficients, I then get the capital F of s breaks down into one over s minus s times s squared 
or I mean divided by s squared plus omega squared. So now if I take the inverse transform to figure out capital or little y2, I have two terms to deal with. The first is taking the inverse transform of the exponential, e to the negative bs divided by s, and that leads to u subscript b of t, which is our step function. And now I take the inverse transform of all this stuff, which is the exponential e to the negative bs times s over s squared plus omega squared. This is my capital F of s now using the table. And then that means by inverse transform, little f of t is equal to cosine omega t. And so when I transform back this function, I get the time delay because of the exponential saying, yo, this has got to wait till b seconds till anything happens. That's when the system gets an extra load. And then the cosine function is the response to that external force that turns on at b seconds. Only I'm going to tell that cosine to, hor to shift b seconds to the right in time, so b seconds forward in time. It's going to shift over there and wait for that change to happen. And what I'll notice then finally is that both share a step function, and I'll factor that out so that now this term right here has a new max at t equal b, let's say, which is at cosine, now becomes cosine of zero, which is one, and so I get a one minus one, so that's at zero. And then I get a new min at t equal, let's see, it goes all the way down to negative one, so that would be at t equal, I don't know, let's see, we would have to set omega times t minus b equal to pi. So I get that t is equal to pi over omega plus b. So at that moment in time, cosine will be a maximum negative number. And so the max is at y equal 2. So what that means is that if the system was oscillating about y equals 0 before, and is now oscillating about y equal um, 1, it's been displaced one unit down, not taking into account any of this prefactor stuff, right? That's going to scale everything. And it will oscillate from 2 all the way up to 0. So instead of oscillating from 1 to negative 1, now it's going from 0 to 2. Right? So the same oscillations are happening. They're just around a new equilibrium point. All right. And that is going to be the second of the two terms. And so in the that means in the final solution here, I have y, which is y1 added to y2. I add these things together. And then I think about it as a step or converting these step functions into piecewise functions. And so the first thing I see is that for t values that are less than a, the system's doing nothing. I haven't struck it with a hammer yet. Now for t between a and b, in time, the system takes on its sinusoidal oscillations. But then when t becomes greater than or equal to b, I've loaded the system up and I pick up the second term now which says, oh, I pick up more oscillations. And if I were to look at what would happen here, here is the time interval 1 from 0 to pi. So I'm going to choose my little a to be equal to pi. And I'm going to choose my little b to be equal to 3 pi. And so for the first pi seconds, nothing's going on. Now, for the second interval of time between pi and 3 pi, a sinusoidal oscillation turns on. And then from 3 pi onward, after I load up the system with an extra mass, or I could think about it as just tugging down on the system constantly with a downward force, what do I see? I see oscillations about a new equilibrium value, right? And here are these oscillations between 0 and 2. So after b, t equal b. And then before we had oscillations for t less than b, but greater than or equal to a. So the Dirac function is like a pulse of energy to the system, which can take a system that's not moving and, and bring it into motion. It's almost as if you gave it an initial condition of some instantaneous velocity at that point. And then we have the step function, which allows um, different sorts of loads, different sorts of forces to be applied at different times. And in this case, what we see is that it changes the, the equilibrium point about which everything oscillates.